With tensions escalating in the space race, the USSR was determined to develop the capability to destroy the satellites of opposing nations. Soviet experiments tinkered with many possible weapons, from military space stations to mechanical claws. Starting in the 1970s, they even developed ground-based laser anti-satellite weapons, reportedly blinding U.S. spy satellites temporarily throughout the 70s and 80s. As the U.S. Air Force tested its own counters to the Soviet developments and considered the need to disable its own out-of-date satellites, it planned an operation named Celestial Eagle. Instead of launching a space-based weapon, however, plans called for a highly unconventional deployment. The test flight would send Major Wilbur Doug Pearson on a mission to destroy a satellite from an F-15A fighter using an air-to-space missile. Bold Orion and the SPIN program. As orbiting satellites proved their surveillance capabilities and began to offer the threat of hosting weapons systems in space, the United States Air Force began investing in anti-satellite missile technology in the 1950s. One early effort that reached the experimental phase was the Bold Orion, an air-launched ballistic missile carried aboard a Boeing B-47 Stratojet. During its final test in 1959, it approached the defunct Explorer 6 satellite to a distance of 4 miles at an altitude of 156 miles. The Bold Orion, however, was not armed during the test, as the nuclear warhead it was intended to carry could have unintentionally shot down still operational satellites along with the Explorer 6. This imprecision of the Bold Orion, along with other tactical limitations as a result of relying on a single-stage launch vehicle, pushed the U.S. to pursue alternative technologies. The Department of Defense inaugurated program Space Intercept, or SPIN, in 1960 for this purpose, and in 1963 the Nike Zeus became the first missile to blow up a satellite, although it was still using a nuclear warhead and failed to satisfy collateral damage concerns. President Jimmy Carter further encouraged the Air Force to develop a new type of anti-satellite missile after the Soviet Union declared its own Istrebitel Sputnik, or Satellite Fighter System, operational in 1970. The IS system utilized shrapnel warheads aboard a ground-launched missile, but it required that a target satellite's ground track pass above the launch site. In contrast, the U.S. continued to prefer a mobile air-launched missile. ASM-135 the U.S. solution eventually coalesced around a Boeing AGM-69 short-range attack missile that was modified to create the ASM-135 ASAT, or anti-satellite missile. The primary rocket engine was taken from an LPC-415, which used solid propellant and had two pulses. Ling Temos Vought, or LTV Corporation, further modified the launch vehicle to add the Altair-3, a second-stage motor with hydrazine thrusters that facilitated aiming and reaching for a satellite. The anti-satellite missile was also fitted with a ring laser gyroscope and an infrared sensor created by Hughes Research Laboratories. The same company created another essential part of the missile, the Miniature Homing Vehicle, or MHV, which spun in 30 rotations per second before launch. This MHV could track its intended target through the infrared sensor, although it did not determine spatial data such as altitude or distance. The intent was for the warhead to destroy its target using the sheer kinetic energy generated from the speed at impact. This not only avoided the collateral damage associated with using a nuclear warhead, but it also made the missile significantly cheaper. Once assembled, the ASM-135 was around 20 feet long and weighed over 2,600 pounds. F-15A The ASM-135 was just small and light enough to be mounted on a fighter jet, and the F-15A was chosen as the launch vehicle. This was an early model of the McDonnell Douglas F-15 Eagle air superiority fighter that has been in combat since 1967 and is only scheduled to stop being produced in 2022. Whereas a ground-based rocket launch could be easily detected and tracked, it would be difficult to anticipate an attack from a common and nondescript fighter jet. The plane was modified in order to carry out the mission on its centerline station and to carry extra equipment on a centerline pylon. Furthermore, liquid helium was placed where the gun ammunition drum would normally be so that it could cool the infrared detector on the miniature homing vehicle. Other modifications were done to the computer and heads-up display so that the pilot could steer the missile in its early stages after launch. The first test flight carrying an ASM-135 took place in December of 1982 from the test center at the Edwards Air Force Base in California. By August of 1985, the Air Force was ready to test against a satellite, and President Reagan authorized shooting down the Solwyn satellite. Congress was given notice and everything was ready, but some objections to the mission remained. The Solwyn Satellite The Solwyn Satellite, also known as P-78-1, had been sent to space in February of 1979 from the Vandenberg Air Force Base in California. As a telescope satellite, its purpose was to capture space phenomena. It was the first satellite ever to discover a comet. 
It's Coronagraph, an attachment that blocks out the sun's surface light to reveal objects that might otherwise be lost in the bright glare, helped it discover a local of nine Kruitz comets. In fact, according to a physicist at the time, the satellite had been, quote, the backbone of coronal research throughout the last seven years. Unfortunately, the degrading batteries caused constant shutdown of its non-vital mechanisms, and by 1985, its tape data recorders were also malfunctioning. Having little remaining life, it was selected for destruction that year. Some scientists were not in favor of having the satellite destroyed, since two of its measurement instruments were still functioning and returning valuable data. In the words of an enraged physicist David Rust from Johns Hopkins University, quote, I can't believe that they couldn't find a piece of space junk, really, instead of a working laboratory. Yet the decision had been made. The Air Force needed a working satellite to be the target in order to get confirmation of its destruction. A spokesperson for the Pentagon claimed that, quote, based on cost and return on investment, P-78-1 would have been turned off in early 1987 when ground systems were scheduled to be upgraded. NASA was informed of these plans in July of 1985 and made a model to test the consequences of shooting down the satellite. It was discovered that debris from the satellite would remain in orbit well into the 1990s and would later force NASA to increase the shielding of its future space station. Congress had political concerns as well, and a ban on these experiments was scheduled to commence on October of 1985. In response, the Department of Defense made a swift decision to move forward with the plan to destroy Solwind before the impending restrictions. Despite their own objections, NASA stepped in to assist the Air Force in monitoring the effect of the test by way of orbital debris telescopes and a re-entry radar placed in Alaska. Celestial Eagle Flight The mission to take down the Solwind P-78-1 was given to Major Wilbert D. Doug Pearson, who had become the first pilot to ever shoot down a satellite. He would have to fly the F-15A to more than 35,000 feet and orient his aircraft almost vertically from the ground. From that position, he would need to fire the ASM-135 at a distance of 200 or more miles away from his target. On September 14, 1985, Pearson took off from Edwards Air Force Base and sped his aircraft to Mach 1.2, supersonic speed, before pulling 3.8 Gs to point his plane up at 65 degrees. Once the Celestial Eagle was at 38,100 feet, Major Pearson slowed down to Mach 0.934. The missile separated from the craft, with his MHV pointed towards the center of the target. Traveling at 15,000 miles per hour, or 24,140 kilometers per hour, after its second stage booster fired, the missile's 30-pound kinetic warhead collided with and destroyed the Solwind. The metal debris from impact turned out to be so dark it was almost undetectable by the NASA orbital debris telescopes, and only two pieces were identified. This unexpected development was attributed by scientists to the carbonization of organic material in the target. Plastic satellite components likely vaporized and then condensed on the metal in the form of soot. Infrared telescopes revealed more of the pieces that had remained in orbit, and NASA reported that by 1998, only eight of the 285 shards identified were still above Earth. A solar heating phenomenon that reached a record high from 1989 to 1991 expanded the atmosphere and accelerated the decomposition of the Solwind debris. This unexpectedly quick decomposition meant that the debris from this test would not play a role in the launch of a space station as feared. Retirement and Remembrance Although the test proved a success, the Air Force eventually canceled plans to prepare 112 operational ASM-135s and adapt 20 F-15s for similar use, when high cost and additional technological challenges forced them to focus on other projects in 1988. Projected cost of deployment had ballooned from $500 million to $5.3 billion. In 2009, with the transition from F-15 A and B to newer C and D types, the historic Celestial Eagle airframe was retired to the Desert Aircraft Boneyard after serving in the Air Reserve. 22 years after the original flight, on September 13, 2007, Major Pearson, then working for the 125th Fighter Wing, arrived at the Mountain Home Air Force Base in Idaho with his family to help retire the plane. This time, Major Pearson wouldn't be flying, but rather it would be his son, Captain Todd Pearson, who would take command. In honor of the celebration, the name Celestial Eagle was painted on the nose of the aircraft, while the captain's and sergeant's names were painted each to one side of the cockpit. The Pearson family even produced a photograph of Captain Pearson as a child for the occasion, sitting inside the cockpit with his father before the original historic flight. About the event, Captain Pearson commented, quote, I've always been an aviation buff, and I've wanted to fly Eagle since I was three because my dad flew them. The flight was a significant event in military aviation history, and I'm glad that I've been able to be a part of this 22 years later. His father, the historic pilot, retired as Major General, and went on to work at Lockheed Martin after 34 years of distinguished service for the Air Force. At the Air Force Flight Test Center, he led more than 200 testing programs and amassed more than 5,000 flying hours across hundreds of aircraft. To this date, 
He is the only pilot to have ever shot down a satellite. Thank you for watching our video. Please like and subscribe to our Dark Documentaries channels to find more exciting historical content. And don't forget to hit the bell icon to be notified of our newest videos, which we publish regularly. Stay tuned.